Epic family, good morning. morning. Next Sunday, we are celebrating baptisms here at Epic. We already have three people signed up and ready to go, and I know that this is a next step for many of you, so be sure to reach out so that we can add you to the list and so that we can answer any questions that you might have. Also, next Sunday is Commitment Day for Home 2.0, okay? So be praying and thinking through how God would have you to participate in this initiative as we build out 414 Brandon Street and we set even deeper roots in this city and in this neighborhood. Now, for today, I want to kick us off with a question, and it's a very serious question, and I want us all to participate, okay? So if this applies to, to you, just raise your hand, okay? Here's the question. How many of you like to be told what to do? Any, any? How many of you like for someone else that is not you to dictate how you should live your life? Okay. No surprise, but hey, just to make sure I didn't lose the crowd already, okay, that you didn't check out, let me throw out some softball questions here, okay? How many of you like the weather here in San Francisco? Raise your hand, okay, good. How many of you like ice cream? Okay, how many of you are breathing? Okay, call the medics, there's a few people not breathing. All right, again, how many of you like to be told what to do? Okay, one person, okay. But no surprises here, no surprises whatsoever. The obvious is stated that we just seem to have a problem with being told what to do. Why is that? Why is that? Well, a big reason is because in our culture, in our culture, we have elevated autonomy and we have elevated freedom to kind of like this level of indisputable value. And, And we have equated freedom with being able to do whatever we want not what someone else tells us to do. That's what freedom is, to be able to do whatever we want, not what someone else tells us to do. A landmark research study, I don't know why they call it a landmark because it's going to state the obvious here, but a landmark research study by a sociologist and Berkeley professor found that freedom is perhaps Americans' most important value. This professor, he and his team, they did this study in the 80s, And in the 90s, and again in the late 2000s, and they found the same thing. And if you're wondering if it still applies 15 years later, I think all we need to look at is COVID to give us all the evidence that we need to know that, hey, we love our freedom. We love to be able to do whatever we want. Come on. What is the crescendo in our national anthem? Isn't it when the singer hits that high note of, or the land? I'm not going to sing, people. Come on. Of the, oh, come on. If they're able to hit it, that's when you get the goosebumps. That's when everyone starts, comp- not when you get to home of the brave, but then you're done with it, right? It's the land of the free. Come on, isn't Mel Gibson yelling in Braveheart, they'll never take away our freedom, right? Isn't that etched in our memory? We love our freedom. And not simply because it inspires us, but there is a fundamental core belief at the root of why we treasure it so much. Check out this quote. Most of us in America believe a few simple propositions that seem so clear and self-evident they scarcely need to be said. Here are the propositions. Number one, choice is a good thing in life. And the more of it we have, the happier we are. Here's the second one. Authority is inherently suspect. Nobody. Nobody should have the right to tell others what to think or how to behave. A journalist wrote that as commentary to his study on 1950s Chicago. But the same could be said of San Francisco in the 2020s or of any other town or city in America. Not much has changed. And some of you read that and you're probably probably thinking, well, what's wrong with those statements? It it is possible that the majority of us in this room wholeheartedly agree that the more choice equals greater happiness and that nobody should be able to tell anyone else what to do. But here's my problem with it. The first problem I have with it is where it says nobody should have the right to tell someone what to think or how to behave. 
And it's just this word in the beginning, nobody. Nobody, really? Nobody? And here's what scares me about that word. Does, does that include God too? Has our freedom, our idea of freedom, been applied to God as well, where he can't tell us what to do? Or if you don't even want to go there just yet, does it also apply to authority figures in our lives who have the best interests in mind for us, like parents? Does it apply there as well? The, the medical profession seems to think so. Now that my son is 12, I can't even look at his medical records unless he grants me access. Because I might not. I don't get it. I can't tell him what to do or how he should receive care. But I pay for it exactly, yes. <laughs> but here's my second problem with it. I believe the entire proposition is just faulty. This idea that the more freedom we have to choose whatever we want is what's going to make us happier, guys, that's a lie. That's not true. What I've experienced, what the scriptures teach us, what sociology is even discovering is that if we live that way, it will actually lead to more problems than good. It will lead to more harm than good. This is, might be a simplistic statement, but it, it, it proves the point. We are a generation that has more options than ever, but yet we are more depressed than ever. It has not led to greater happiness. Epic family, as we dive into the topic of God's will and his plan for our lives in this series, we have to talk about freedom, what it is and what it isn't, okay? And so the title of my message today is this, is there any freedom for me in God's will? Is there any freedom for us in God's will? Now, this is a bit of a play on words, okay? This question is actually tackling two issues, and we're going to address both of them in regards to freedom and God's will. First, we're going to tackle the question that many of us have, and it's this. When it comes to God's will, do I get to choose some things, or is there only one right answer for each situation? Many of us have that question. When it comes to the most important decisions in life, like who to marry, or where to work, or where to live, do I have options, or is there only one specific plan for my life and everything else is second best? So that's the first thing, the first aspect of this idea of freedom and God's will that we're going to look at. But here's the second challenging question that we're going to tackle. Are we truly free if God demands obedience and restricts us with his laws and commandments? Are we truly free if God demands obedience and restricts us with laws and commandments? You see, the first question has to do with freedom in decision-making. The second question has to do with the tension between freedom and restrictions. Can they actually coexist? So quite a bit to cover, okay? So let's get started and go where it all started with Adam and Eve. And Pastor Ben was there last week as he talked about vocation, but we're going to go there again. I'm going to ask you to stand with me as we read God's word. We're going to read five verses, verses 8 and 9 of chapter 2, and also verses 15 through 17. This is the story of creation, the account. So chapter 2, verse 9 says this, Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed in the garden. The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground. All these trees were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were two other trees. One was the tree of life, and the other was the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Verse 15. So the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden. But you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. Okay, go ahead and have a seat. I pray that God's word will speak to us today. In the garden, what you see is that God gives Adam and Eve a ton, a ton of freedom, 
a ton of freedom. In verse 9, it says that God made all kinds of trees to grow out of the ground. And he didn't just make any crappy trees. No, no, no. It says that all of these trees that he made were good for food and they were pleasing to the eye. And then in verse 16, God actually says to the man, he says this, you are free. He uses that word. You are free to eat from any tree in the garden except one. Any tree in the garden except one. Now, before we focus in on the one, before we focus in on the restriction, let's focus in on the freedom. As it relates to God's plan for your life, when it comes to your life, God gives you a ton of freedom, a ton of freedom. But unfortunately, most Christians don't live as if that is true. Some of us get paralyzed and hung up when making a decision because we can't seem to discern clearly what God would have us to do in that specific situation. It's as if we believe that there's only one right choice, only one right choice that will lead to it all working out perfectly, that will lead to success, and everything else that we might choose will end in disaster. And so we think it's our job to beg and convince God to tell us his perfect will because we don't want to make the wrong choice. We're afraid to make the wrong choice. And so we're trying to discern all the signs. God, what would you have me to do? This is how many of us live. Come on, am I only speaking to myself? We've been there. Most of us have been there. But if that's you, if that's still you today, can I just give you just a bit of advice just to, just to help you out a little bit? And it's this. No one wants you to know God's will more than God does. No one wants you to know God's will more than God does. Seriously. He is not trying to hide from you how he wants you to live. His will is not a mystery that you need to decipher. In fact, his will has already been revealed. It's already been revealed. And here's what I mean by that. When, whenever the Bible mentions the will of God, for the most part, it is referring to moral guidelines that God wants us to follow. It's referring to moral guidelines that he wants us to follow. It's referring to behaviors, not decisions. That's most of the time. The few other times where God actually gives some supernatural direction and, and, um, and, 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 and the will of God is mentioned, it's referring to evangelistic assignments. It's, it's God telling a person or a group of people, go and take my message, go and take the gospel to another person, to another group of people. Never about personal decisions. But it's mainly about, whenever the will of God is mentioned, moral guidelines. Let me give you an example. 1 Thessalonians 4.3. It is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality. Let me ask you, is God's will unclear in this passage? No, 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 not, no, it, it is God's will that we don't sleep around, simple, right? It's clear. Now, let me give you a positive one so you don't think that it's all negative. First Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18, rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. The will of God has to do with how he wants us to live, not with this idea that he has only one specific plan for our lives, like who to marry or where to work or where to live. Now, let me, let's, let's take what we've learned so far. Let's apply it. Let's step on some toes in the process, okay? But let's make this practical, okay? A little bit of a touchy subject. It might not apply to anyone, but let's just say it, okay, in regards to dating and marriage, okay? Some of you need to stop waiting for Mr. or Mrs. Wright. They don't exist. They don't exist. Or at least let me say it another way. There could be several Mr. or Mrs. Wrights. Not at the same time, people, okay? Just one, <laughs> one at a time. And once you get that ring, preferably for the rest of your time, okay? That's the pattern. But this idea that there is one person out there for you and that you're going to hear from God that that is the person... I will caution you with that. And anyone who comes up to you and tells you, God told me you're going to be my spouse, run, okay? <laughs> run. 
I remember one time, B and I were having this conversation, and uh, we, were, we were discussing this topic of, is it one specific plan, one will of God, or are there many options? And at the time, um, B and I, we were just dating, and I was fairly new to my faith, so this is some time ago. And, and at the time, I also, being new to my faith, I was um, both passionate about my faith and my beliefs, but also just a tad bit annoyingly idealistic, okay? Um, and so in regards to this topic, I remember telling B that I thought that I could make it work with anyone in a dating or marriage relationship. That's what I told my girlfriend at the time. She, I know, arrogant and, and just straight up dumb. She didn't like it very much. And the only reason I remember that story is because she doesn't let me forget. About every, about every two or three years, she's like, oh, you can make it work with anyone. Okay, okay. So dumb, so dumb. But I know, not very romantic, but sound theologically. I'm telling you, sound. God's gift to me was it coming out, but just all in the wrong ways. I should have I, I said something like, I believe God gives us freedom in this area, but I wouldn't want to live my life with anyone but you. That would have been smooth. Y- y'all could borrow that line. Y'all could borrow that. But I made the rookie mistake, man. Now, hear this. Don't get me wrong, though. Even though God gives us great freedom in this area, he sets parameters. He, he sets boundaries. So he says, marry whoever you want, but make sure they're a Christian. And make sure it's for the rest of your life. Work wherever you want, but work as unto the Lord. Don't make it all about you. Do it with excellence. Have some integrity. Don't work in unjust industries. You, you see what I'm saying? So when we are making some of the biggest decisions in our lives, we don't need to hear a voice from heaven telling us what to do. If you hear it, great, but that's not going to be the normal pattern. What we need in those moments, what we need in those moments and what God promises to give us is wisdom. Wisdom to make the right kinds of decisions. I like how Eugene Peterson defines wisdom. He says this, Wisdom is not primarily about knowing the truth, although it certainly includes that. It is skill in living. Wisdom is taking truth and knowing how to apply it to a specific situation so that you make a wise decision and not a foolish one. Lindsay and Krista a couple of weeks ago talked about how we can gain wisdom through the scriptures and how we can gain wisdom in community. James 1.5 says, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault and it will be given to you. And so instead of asking for revelation from God as to what you should do, ask God for wisdom to be able to make the right kinds of decisions. So can we just pause here for a moment? And I want you to just bring to mind a decision that you've been contemplating. You've been feeling a little bit stuck. And I just want to give us about 15, 20 seconds to ask God for wisdom because he gives generously. So just say a short prayer in your heart, in your mind, under your breath, and ask God for wisdom. God, you know our situations, and we ask you for wisdom to make the right kinds of decisions. Amen. Who knows? Who knows how different of a decision you will make just because of that short prayer? That's what God can do. Now, let me give you just a a few principles that will kind of summarize what we've been talking about. This is from Gary Friesen's book. I I believe it's called Decision Making and the Will of God. And so here's a framework on how to make godly decisions. And some of this I've stated clearly. Others of it, it's been implied, but let's summarize it. Number one, 
where God commands, we must obey. When there's a clear command, when there's a clear moral guideline, we must obey. Number two, where there is no command, and there's a lot of those situations, God gives us freedom and wisdom to choose. And then the third one, which is important, when we have chosen what is moral and wise, we must trust the sovereign God to work all the details together for good. I love that. Where there is a command, we must obey. Where there is no, God, where there is no command, we, must, we have the freedom and the wisdom to choose. And once we have made a moral and wise choice, we must trust the sovereign God that he's going to work it out all for our good, Romans 8, 28. I don't know about you, but that just lifts a weight off of my shoulders when I'm making decisions. It's as if God is telling us, don't wait on me. Yes, seek me. None of this makes sense if we're not seeking God. Yes, seek me, but just go ahead and do something. He gives us that freedom. Go ahead and do something. Does that mean that God doesn't give us impressions or closed doors? Or, no, no, he does all those things. But if you're waiting for a specific or clear answer or if you think you're just pigeonholed into one thing, God is trying to remove you from that. God doesn't want you to be stuck as we talked about in our last series. God wants you to keep growing and moving forward and he has given you a ton of freedom to do just that. All right? So let's shift gears a little bit. Now that we have the freedom to, to make decisions with wisdom, let's talk about if we are truly free with the restrictions that God has placed on us, okay? Verses 16 and 17, let's read them again. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. When some of us read this, Here's what happens to our modern, Western, San Francisco hearts and minds. Here's what they do. We disregard all of the freedom given. We set it aside, and instead we focus in on the one restriction. We focus in on the one restrictions, and what, what we start to think is, how dare God tell me what I can or cannot do? A loving God wouldn't do that. That is oppressive. But here's the thing. There is no such thing as freedom without restrictions. There is no such thing as freedom without restrictions. Just think of a former inmate who is leaving the prison. They are now free, right? But there's still restrictions in place. In my own situation, let me give you an example personally. I can't live here in San Francisco and be a part of this great church community and at the same time live in Florida where my mom and my sisters and my extended family live. If I'm being honest with you, those are two things I really want. I want both of those things greatly. But I'm not free enough to use that word to do both. I have to choose. And freedom, that's what freedom is. It gives you the ability, it grants you the ability to choose. But whenever there's a choice, there are trade-offs. There are trade-offs. A grandpa that wants to see his grandkids grow up, he can't live that out and continue eating whatever he wants after being diagnosed with heart disease. He is free to choose, but even in his freedom, there are restrictions. There are restrictions. True freedom means you lose one thing to gain something else. It means you lose one thing to gain something else. I, love, I like how Tim Keller writes about this. He says, in many areas of life, freedom is not so much the absence of restrictions as finding the right ones, the liberating restrictions. Here's what he's saying. Restrictions aren't, aren't all that bad. They're not all that bad, at least not all of them. At least not all of them, because when, because when I say that restrictions aren't all that bad, I'm not talking about removing or changing civil liberties and freedoms. No, 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 we're not, we're not talking about that. Civil freedoms have done a massive amount of good in the area of justice for women and children and my, minorities to think that I wouldn't be able during certain periods of history to have this role or to teach such a diverse crowd is insane. 
So I'm all for freedom, and I'm all for removing restrictions. But we have taken that concept of freedom, which is good, and applied it in other areas, which is not good. We've taken that concept of freedom, and, and we've gone way too far with it. Our culture is pushing for an idea of freedom, a definition of freedom that sheds off all restrictions. But do you really want that? Do you really want that? Listen, aren't you glad that your spouse has restrictions? Aren't you glad that your employer is somewhat bound to you, somewhat committed to you? Come on, why is it that the companies and the spouses that think that the rules don't apply to them and who feel free to do whatever they want, aren't they the ones that always get into trouble? Aren't they the ones that always leave a wake of, of broken relationships behind them and of broken people behind them? Is that what we want? Come on, you can't be free in the contemporary sense of the word and be in a strong love relationship. It's just not possible. It's just not possible. And so we have to seriously question the usefulness of the type of freedom that our culture is peddling, that our culture is, is pushing. Is freedom without restrictions truly the type of freedom that will make us happier? Are there really no consequences to such a way of living? I like how... Um, the Apostle Paul addresses the gap between what the culture says and, and, and about freedom and what actually happens when we choose the world's definition for freedom, okay? He, he, in this passage that I'm going to read, Paul is quoting the culture, but then he's applying his commentary to what the culture has to say. He says this, the culture says, everything is permissible for me. I am free to do whatever I want. But Paul's like, well, maybe, but not everything's beneficial. Not everything is good for you. He goes on to say, the culture says everything is permissible for, for me. I'm not going to let anyone tell me what to do. I'm going to do what I want to do. But Paul's like, I get you. I hear you. But I won't be mastered by anything. That last line from Paul is strong. Paul understood something that we all need to understand, is that it, it is absolutely possible for us to become enslaved by what promised to free us. Absolutely, and we've all experienced this. This is what Adam and Eve experienced. The serpent promised Eve, Eve, girl, if you would just eat from the tree that is restricted, don't listen to what God says, but if you were to do that, in essence, you know what, what's going to happen, Eve? You're going to gain greater freedom. You're going to be just like God, just like God. That's what he promised her, greater freedom. But what actually happened? Not greater freedom. Let's just say they, they lost their freedom. The freedom that they once enjoyed was taken away. Can I stop for a moment and just ask you, what is, what is your tree? What is the tree that is promising you greater freedom or greater joy or greater pleasure? But it's just, it was a bait and switch. We all have it. We've all been there. And what comes to mind probably for some of us is, is, are the vices, right? Drugs, alcohol, pornography. You're right, we, we, we engage in these things for good reasons, right? We, we, we just want to take the edge off. We want to numb the pain. We want to feel joy again. We want to feel pleasure. But these things, many times, what we've experienced is that they take us farther than we want to go, and they hold us for longer than we want to stay, and we can't shake it. Our minds tend to go there with the things that enslave us. But many times, it could be good things that we've made ultimate. Just think about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It says that it was good for food and pleasing to the eye as well. It was like just like all the other trees. But it was promising something, offering something that only God could give them. Sometimes work is that for us. 
We try to find only our meaning and significance in work, and it robs us of our time. It robs us of our joy. A relationship could be that for us. What is your tree? What have you been looking to that only God can give you? What have you put before God? Can I, can I just tell you what your greatest temptation in life is and what it's going to continue to be? It's the same temptation Adam and Eve dealt with. It's the same temptation that I deal with. And it's simply this. It's living a life independent of God. It, it, it's wanting to be free of needing God and not depending on him. That's our greatest temptation. Independence is not necessarily a bad thing, but it's just not God's goal for us in our relationship with him. Let me show you this quote from a commentator as he contrasts the difference between God's objective and a parent's objective. I love this. Look what he writes. A parent's love for a child acts in order to eliminate the child's need for the parent. What he's saying there is that a caring and loving parent is going to build and invest in this child so that the child is built up to a point where that child is becoming increasingly less dependent on the parent and more independent. That, uh, that's what good parents do, and they work towards that, and they do that in age-appropriate ways. But God is different. He writes, God's love, in contrast, is not optimized in his becoming superfluous. God's love is not optimized or maximized when he becomes unnecessary. No, but it's in our becoming dependent on him in continually maturing ways. Here's what he's saying. Our lives work best when we are dependent on God. That's when they work best. Our lives work best to bring back the phrase I started with, when we allow him to tell us what to do. When we enjoy the freedom that he's given us, but we do it within the parameters he's given us. But here's the thing. But we fall apart when we are apart from him. We end up in bondage when we run away from him and run to other things. And this is probably my most counterintuitive statement of the day, but I'm going to say it anyway because somehow in the kingdom of God it makes sense and it is true. You are most free when you are bound to Jesus. You are most free when you are bound to Jesus. Come on, Jesus was the most freed being that there was after Adam and Eve. And yet he bound himself to a cross so that you and I could be free when we attach to him, when we place our faith in him. Remember, Freedom is not about you doing whatever you want. That's what leads us into bondage. True freedom, though, is binding ourselves to Jesus and fixing our eyes on him. And I want to give you an illustration. And it's from uh, <clears throat> an Indian poet who won the uh, Nobel Prize for literature, like in the first half of the 1900s. And he writes this about a violin string. It's a powerful imagery of what we're talking about, being bound and finding freedom. He writes, I have on my table a violin string. It is free to move in any direction I like. If I twist one end, it responds. It is free. This is the line that I love. But it is not free to sing. It is not free to sing. So I take it, and I fix it into my violin. I bind it, and when it is bound, it is free for the first time to sing. Epic family, I want you and I to sing, to sing. Jesus wants us to sing for our lives to resonate this beautiful melody, and for it to impact anyone who comes in contact with us. For freedom, Christ has set you free. Christ has set you free from things, but he has set you free for something else, and that is to love others, to love others. As a violin string comes alive when it is bound to the violin, so you and I come alive when we are bound to Jesus. Jesus does not want to restrict your life, at least not for restriction's sake. He wants to set you free. And as John 8.36 says, 
who the sun sets free is free indeed. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you for the gift of your son who was bound on the cross so that we might be set free. I pray that today many of us in this room will place our faith in him. And today many of us will surrender our lives to him in new ways where we embrace the freedom that you've given us but also the restrictions and the parameters from which, in which those freedoms and blessings have been given. God, we ask that you help us. Help us by giving us wisdom in the decisions that we are going to make throughout our entire lives. You give us freedom in that area as well. And we pray for the wisdom that we need to make the right kinds of decisions. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen and amen. I'm going to ask you to stand and just kind of want to go through a few responses that we might have coming out of this message. For, for some of us, the response might be for us to actually bind our life to Jesus for the very first time. And you might not know what that all entails, what that all means, but what you do know is that you have tried to live your life your way and probably not with the greatest results. And so the offer for you today is to follow him, is to trust in him. And when you do that, you will find that you will start to become the person who you were meant to be. You will find that you can be truly free and truly happy. And so you can respond. You can let us know that you're ready to start your faith journey for the first time on your Connect card. You could come up for prayer. But you could just tell God right where you are. God, I thank you for sending your son, for giving his life for my sake so that I can be free. I place my trust in you. In Christ's name, amen. For others of you, you've already placed your faith in Jesus, and your next step is baptism. Baptism is a beautiful picture of the freedom that we have in Christ as we are lowered into the water and raised up again. It's a declaration that the old is past, that the shackles are broken and we are brought to new life, that we are free. And so next Sunday, we're going to be celebrating baptisms and it would be a privilege for me or for Shauna. Shauna is going to baptize someone that went through Alpha. If you've gone through Alpha and your faith has grown, she would love to baptize you next week. But what we want to do on that day is just celebrate the freedom that you have found in Christ. And again, like we started the message, some of us are facing some major decisions and we've been feeling a little bit stuck. But remember, keep this in mind. Indecision is a decision. God has given you freedom. And he offers you the wisdom to make the right kinds of decisions. And so if you want prayer for any of these things or even for something that I didn't even mention, some of the leaders were going to be up here in the front. But let's worship God at this time in the freedom that we have. Let's respond.